Buonasera, uh, mi sentite? Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Can you all understand me and hear me? My name is Marco Zatterin. I work for the for La Stampa, which is a uh, startup that started open in 1887, and <laughs> it's a renowned newspaper. We were quite su successful in this last uh, uh, century and a half. We were more successful than food rights, and we are here to defend food rights, and we do not always have good results. This is the reason why Terra Madre organized this panel, to talk about social rights and social justice. And, uh, how important it is to have food for all, and uh, food needs to be protected in a way that is respectful uh, towards the planet, towards the uh, right of those who eat and don't want to be eaten up. Before giving the floor to Barbara Albini, who's the uh, uh, being president of Food Italia, we have uh, Antonio Augusto Mendes dos Santos, uh, a Brazilian organic farmer, slow food activist, the president of a few cooperatives. He did a lot for his country. On my right, we have uh, uh, Victoria Tauli Koput, indigenous uh, leader of the Kankanae Igorot. I hope I pronounce it correctly. There's no Italian page on Wikipedia, for example. We should have an Italian page on Wikipedia. It's an important population. Uh, eating mainly and making a living out of rice, and they have difficulties in uh, growing rice because they have either too much or too little water. And then uh, Willy Peyote is a rapper. He's involved in uh, protecting the rights in all the stages of the world. And then uh, last but not least, Don Luigi Ciotti. He established Libera in 1995. But before uh, starting our presentation, I give the floor to Barbara Napini. Thank you, Marco. Thank you all. I will be very brief. I don't want to uh, uh, take too much time away from uh, this evening or this afternoon's uh, speakers. I'll try to explain why slow food is involved in social justice. Slow food is involved in social justice because the theme of food is closely connected to human rights. Because food um, provides a survival to uh, 7 billion people in the planet. And so to food and to the way food is produced, we devoted 700 events here at Parco Dora to uh, um, improve our knowledge about food. And I think that the uh, issue of uh, human rights emerged several times when we talked about food. We talked about uh, food foreign sovereignty. We talked about access to land and water. These are finite resources. It's an issue of uh, human rights. And then we talked about uh, the um, right of uh, the workers, of indigenous populations, of women. And then we talked about uh, hunger. Hunger is an issue concerning human rights. Uh, and it's uh, an issue that is linked uh, to poverty, not to paucity. Those who do not have a regular access to food, they do not have access to food because they are poor, not because there's no food on the planet. And that's an issue of denied human rights. And um, we devoted one of the most important uh, events of these five days uh, to food sovereignty, this conference. And we want to be present. We want to be involved in this theme because we are sure that there's no peace without uh, justice. And in a serious situation, such as the current one, we have a big opportunity, that of regeneration. Regeneration is a way to renew our thoughts and our language. 
the first regeneration, the most urgent and most difficult regeneration is that of our thoughts. And that's not a natural, spontaneous uh, process. It's a uh, a uh, process that is based on uh, awareness, on willingness. And it's possible if we change our spectacles, if we change our vision. And uh, change will be brought about. And we can opt for finding solutions, or we can also opt for being a problem. And we certainly want to side with solutions. And uh, we use different languages. And uh, today we'll have uh, speakers who will talk about projects, activism, music. We have biodiverse speakers. Uh, so our generation starts from food and goes towards a future of social justice, equity, democracy, self-determination, and freedom. And I'm saying this because we are sure that we'll be saved or only if all of us will be saved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. So food and gastronomy require awareness. And if they are practiced with a degree of awareness, they can also start a political movement. Those who do not eat they do not eat because they are poor, not because there is no food on the planet. And I, while I was preparing for this conference, I found a statement by Caroline Petrini, who said that pleasure is a right of all. And among the pleasures, gastronomy, gastronomic pleasure is included. So if we manage to have gastronomic pleasure, positive changes for the society take place. And these positive changes may have a cascade effect on the life of all of us. So requirements and the taste need to be combined. But unfortunately, this does not happen. We'll listen to the speakers who are very different. They lead different lives, but they have something in common. Uh, that is to say, each of them tried to do something for social rights, for social justice, for food for all. So each speaker will have 10 minutes, and they will share with us their experiences, and they will try and tell us what we, as part of a community, can do to try and find at least a part of a solution to a problem so that each of us can do something useful. I would like to start off with Victoria. Victoria, what is your experience? What can we learn from your experience? Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Well, uh, <clears throat> I come from a community and indigenous people, so basically do subsistence agriculture, and we have been self-sufficient no, for, for ages. Uh, but now, of course, uh, we see a lot of threats. I used to be the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and in that capacity, I was able to go to several countries, and I saw basically the big challenges that indigenous peoples face as far as food security is concerned. Uh, one example I can cite is in Paraguay. I went to Paraguay and I went to a community in the Chaco where the Sahoyamaxa people are. And there have 14,000 hectares of land that they live traditionally, but it was taken over by a German businessman who, during the Stroessner dictatorship and deprived these people of their land. And that is when, when I was there, I saw that there were several children who have, have, have died because of the lack of food. Malnutrition is very high. You know? And of course, uh, uh, water, they even have to buy the water that they need because they were living in the highways. You know? And so that was a big issue. A case was brought 
at the national level, but the national court said, no, they cannot uh, uh, <clears throat> stop this German because they have a bilateral investment treaty with Germany where they cannot expropriate or nationalize the lands. No? So that's, uh, that's the situation. It was brought to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, and the court decided that the right of the people to life, to dignity, of course, to food, has been, have been violated, and so the land should be restituted back to them. No? When I visited, the lands were not, st that was in, tw I visited in 2014, the court decided in 2007, but it was not still implemented. There were just payments given to the people whose children were killed. I died, whose children died. And the other case that I saw was in Brazil, no? I went to the area where the Belo Monte Dam was being built. This is like going to be the third largest dam in the world. And the people who were depending on the fish along the Shingo River, uh, the Yoruna, uh, among others, the, their fi no, the fish is not there anymore because of course the water has been dammed and they, the fish cannot be uh, swimming in the rivers anymore. So uh, that, those were the cases that I've seen, at least in Latin America, which really gives me, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, uh, gives, gives me the conclusion that if there is no land security, the right to land, to forests and to fisheries is not recognized by the state and it's violated, then of course people will have no food and their cultures that come along with the food, the knowledge that they, they have will, will also disappear. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, really the problem that indigenous peoples face as, as far as right to food is concerned. So in terms of uh, solutions, my, my proposal is to make sure that, uh, you know, to push strongly for the right to food, right to lands, territories, and resources to be recognized. National laws should be put into place. The right of indigenous peoples to be consulted, you know, to, to, be, uh, to get their consent whenever any government project like dams are brought to their communities or when, when uh, big agricultural plantations, like what I saw in Mato Grosso do Sul in, uh, in Brazil, where tracks and tracks of lands were used for sugar cane and also for production of uh, cow food, no? the uh, soya beans and all that. And so the people, again, they were, on, several of them in fact got killed because they were fighting against the, the expropriation of their lands. And so that's really uh, the kind of problem that we face, where more and more big, a rich people appropriate uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, lands, and some of these lands are indigenous lands, including their forests. And the fisheries, the big fisher trawlers also go and, uh, and uh, uh, get their fish, you know, even in their oceans. So the right to, for them to have that should really be ensured. Uh, in my country, the Philippines, uh, we have people, we are 7,100 islands, so most people, many people are fisher folks. You know? and, and so we managed to get the country to pass a law that protects indigenous people's rights. And one of the rights is for their ancestral waters to be delineated. You know? That they should be delineated, these waters are the ones that uh, the people depend upon. And in, in the, in the place where it was delineated and, and, and protected, many of the fish came back. You know, in the past, all the fish are disappearing. Then the diversity of fishes and other marine resources have come back, and now they are in a better uh, situation. So that's the first thing to think about. And of course, to, for them to be consulted whenever any project is brought to their communities, and to, for them to determine the kind of development that they would like to pursue. No, many indigenous peoples don't like their lands to be converted into monoculture plantations. We have friends in Africa, they are pastoralists, they depend on the, on the grasslands. But some rich people from the Middle East, they went there, they bought some lands to make as the game parks, no, where they can shoot the animals, or as their tourist spots, no, and that is causing a lot of problems. We have some friends here, I remember, from Indorois, who filed a case, and they won the case, but again, it's not being implemented. And so finally, just to say, uh, we can file and we can lose, uh, we can spend a lot of money on filing the cases, 
but uh, at the end of the day, the implementation becomes the problem, no? The states don't implement, the corporations don't listen, no? And so uh, my, uh, my conclusion is that the work that we need to do much more on our side is to further empower our own communities so that they will really have the power to stop these kinds of things that are happening in their, in their territories. They have to sustain their efforts to pass their traditional livelihoods and their knowledge to the younger generations because the younger generations will be the ones who will be able to carry on the, their own traditions and cultures. And finally, of course, to ensure that women are also very much involved, equally involved in the processes. Women, the we, indigenous women are really the food producers. They are the water providers, they are the food producers, but sometimes they don't have a say. And so we need to make sure that they also have a say in deciding the development that they have so that the food sovereignty and food sufficiency will be achieved. Thank you very much. So the first recipe is to try to give more decision-making power to communities, to communities, to talk to young people, and to empower women, uh, to enable women to have a more central role. These are th simple things uh, to uh, think about, but difficult to implement. Uh, Antonio, what's your experience? What can we learn from your experience? Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here. It's 11 months ago, I was recovering from a heart attack. And now I'm here at Terra Madre with all of you. And this is a very happy moment for me. Um, a uh, member of a network of organic farming in southern Brazil. And uh, in Brazil, we have uh, a, the situation by which the Brazilian government gives uh, subsidies, grants, so that we can grow land. And one of the experiences I would like to share with you has to do to uh, school meals, uh, 70 million children in Brazil we have. Uh, we hope that next week we'll have a different government, but the government did not approve an increase of about 30 percent of the amount uh, uh, for um, the uh, children meals at school. Um, uh, that is, 700 of a dollar, that's uh, the amount for each kid, which is next to nothing. We have no agricultural policy helping people to stay in the countryside, so we urgently need, and that's why we uh, use slow food as a tool, so we need to approach communities producing food to find solutions that do not totally depend on public policies because water, access to land, access to housing and uh, health care are very important public policies for those who live in the countryside. And all these policies have been denied to us. And so we need to unite. That's why we uh, work uh, in the field of agroecology and slow food to try and share our experience and to help those who are living in the countryside. Uh, there are uh, 33 million people who are not sure, who have no food security. They do not know whether they'll be able to have the next meal. And that's uh, an extremely difficult situation. We have to think about those who have no food. For example, when I produce food, I think about those who have no food. When 
for example, eating at the Terra Madre canteen, I noticed that we do not prevent food wastes, thinking about those who have no food. And this is one of the priorities. We have to prevent um, um, food wastes in order to regenerate. And this is the first change that we have to bring about. Uh, so when I produce food, I use seeds and um, heirloom seeds. And it's as if uh, I am allowed to keep producing this food from heaven, let's say. But we are blocked in a system uh, that is uh, depending on something else. In Brazil, we had a, an emergency. And uh, during this emergency, Uh, subsidies and aids uh, were given during COVID pande pandemic, but the farmers did not receive any aid, any subsidy at the time of the pandemic, and even now. And uh, now the industries are selling products, saying that it contains meat and there's no meat in it. And so if we go to a supermarket, for example, and uh, we uh, buy meat uh, of any type, uh, prices are extremely high. So what we do in our home can change things. We cannot do big things. I don't want to change the world. But first of all, I want to change myself. And thanks to the change in myself, something else will change. And this links up with what we think about agroecology. There are my neighbors who uh, eat uh, GMO food or who has no food at all, and we have to make progress in this uh, direction. We have to improve things. Uh, I wrote down a few notes because I don't want to forget important things. Uh, but one of the first actions of, uh, of our current president was to eliminate Food Security Council. And that's something that is important for all of us, all of us who work in the field of human rights and work in the field of the right to food. And so our objective is to ensure healthy food to all Brazilian people. FUNAI and CONABE and other control bodies have been uh, cut down and they are involved in social um, uh, rights. We had a, a reduction of uh, about, uh, or cuts uh, of about 30 percent. The national program was cut by 63 percent, 33 percent, sorry. Um, um, I took part in these programs with my cooperatives. For example, the school where my son goes has been included in this program. But we have to bear in mind that many pupils in Brazil just have one meal a day at school. That's why it's so important to overcome this difficult period of time we are going through in Brazil. So we have to put pressure on the government. And our work as a slow food movement, as us activists, is very important to ensure good, clean, and fair food for all, as Mr. Petrini said. And we have to fight for further Uh, progress so that uh, this type of food uh, will be brought to the tables of all Brazilian people. But this problem or this issue do not just uh, relate to Bra Brazil, but to the entire world. Slow food is present everywhere in the world, and so it can do a lot. And we have to fight against hunger in more practical terms and try and counter uh, certain 
farming activities. As a colleague said, we have an issue of monocultures and chemical agents that are used in Brazil, and they are used very frequently. And so when, for example, there's a land producing food and making use of chemical fertilizers, and next to it there's a, an organic farm. If these two pieces of plots of land are so close, there's a contamination. And so it's very difficult to have clean food that is coming out of organic farms. And so we've got to contrast. Uh, the use of uh, uh, chemical fertilizers. Well, hunger is not a Brazilian problem, it's a world problem, but uh, we also have to solve uh, local problems in order to be able to solve the general problems too. And now, Willie, uh, no fish, no culture. Uh, that sounds like a, uh, the title, a good title for a song, if not by you, by Frank Zappa. If fish doesn't, is not caught, uh, the community will die because they can't eat. So this emphasizes the link between eating and growing. What, uh, how can you help us uh, uh, um, solve these uh, problems? What's your approach? Of course, we want the rappers. We want the rappers answer. Well, I I feel I'm an intruder because I'm not an activist. I'm a musician, uh, and I mainly deal with, let's say, useless things, because entertainment and music is not physically useful to anyone. It doesn't feed anyone except the musicians. Um, but music is a medium, is a means, uh, that can entertain people, but it can also tell stories. With music, we can tell stories and uh, rap music and um, um, songwriters, uh, uh, singers also can uh, play a role. Of course, uh, all rights should be respected. Uh, and the greatest uh, discrimination in the world is that has to do with, with money, uh, with wealth. And so music uh, can help uh, by inspiring people to ask, them, ask themselves uh, questions uh, and also to um, um, understand other people's uh, problems. With music and art, we can develop and promote empathy, and that can get a movement started. It can get people involved in other people's problems. But again, I'm just a musician and a rapper. So you explain why, you just explain why you're not useless here. And how do people react? Rights, uh, human rights are something simple. Your right to do whatever you want without interfering with my rights, etc. How does the, your audience react to this type of message, to messages about human rights? Well, I find that people, especially very young people, pay great attention to this kind of message. It was said for a while in uh, Italy that young people um, were no longer protesting after the, the G8 summit in Genoa. Uh, um, people stopped um, demonstrating or was said they shouldn't. But now there are young people who are activists uh, for, but as Chico Mendes says, environmentalism without um, political struggle is gardening. So, uh, I wouldn't blame it on the public, on the audience, uh, if uh, some given themes are not uh, dealt with uh, uh, by music. I think we should blame the communicators. And music can educate audiences. 
what we should do as musicians is to offer alternatives, uh, to help uh, the audience uh, adopt uh, an alternative view on things. So I think that's our role. And I think uh, that we can develop critical thinking, or we can help young people develop uh, uh, critical thinking. It's not uh, on TikTok or via TikTok that you can address uh, young people and get a response from them. And we have to listen to uh, the young people. I'm 37 year old, and so if I address uh, a, an audience of 18 year olds, I could be their father. And it's not uh, that as I'm a little younger than others, uh, I'm better at uh, talking to people. I, I just uh, try to say the truth, and that uh, helps. Uh, I think we should listen to young people, and that we should uh, uh, try and understand diversity, even musical diversity. We need, if we don't understand the language of young people, it's because we don't know their language, not that they are saying things that cannot be understood. So I think young people are never wrong. It's, it's us, the adults, who do not understand them. Well, listening to young people is useful and helping young people uh, ask further questions uh, is a good thing. How about you, Don Luigi Ciotti? I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked the other speakers. In your experience or based on your experience, uh, what... Um, kind of experience can encourage us to do something as soon as we leave this room. Good evening to all of you. I represent us. I do not represent I. I'm here to represent the world of associations, of groups, of people who over the years uh, joined together, joined forces. The, this organization is called Libera. Libera is an association of uh, associations uh, aiming to combat uh, illegality and uh, organized uh, crimes and mafias. Uh, the issue of mafias and organized uh, crime is present everywhere in the world. The Libera Association was set up after the uh, mafia slaughter, after Judge Giovanni uh, Falcone and uh, his wife were killed. And then uh, there was also an attack that killed Paolo Borsellino, Judge Paolo Borsellino. And there were many more attacks that killed hundreds of people, people who were killed by criminal violence. And so we as citizens, as groups, as associations, wondered what we could do. And in 1995, in uh, Italy, we collected one million signatures uh, for a project that is to say to confiscate uh, the assets of uh, mafia organizations, of uh, crim criminal organizations, and to give this money back to the collectivity for social purposes. And these assets are uh, lands, uh, fields, uh, farms. Uh, they need to be confiscated um, in compliance with the public law. And we organized uh, uh, labor cooperatives uh, based on confiscated assets, assets confiscated uh, from the mafia. And then uh, the decision to opt for organic farming has been very important. The cooperatives uh, uh, that uh, start working have to be self-sufficient, the products. Uh, um, s produced by experts over the years, uh, they became good quality products, and of course, they are sold on the market. And these cooperatives uh, enable tens of young people, tens of th hundreds of uh, uh, young people, to uh, work uh, in a dignified way, selling 
good and clean product. So this organization is called Libera. Today is no longer just present in Italy. It's present everywhere in Europe and in Latin America. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were in Argentina because in Argentina, there is a high demand for setting up associations, for setting up a movement with the purpose to confiscate assets from organized crime and use these assets, this land, to give get dignity back to a lot of people. And then make products, products that are really food, healthy food, good, clean and fair food. And this contributes to fight criminality and to fight uh, mafias and organized crime. So this organization was set up in my country, in Italy. So it's us. We put together a lot of uh, forces, but this organization has enemies. Uh, these enemies do not want that. The first enemies are the criminal people, corrupted people, and uh, mafia organizations, because uh, this activity is a slap in the face, because they see that the power that they acquired with violence, with legality, by killing people, and so they see that their power is defeated, is taken away from them, and these assets are given back to young people, to cooperatives, and to groups of people that's a slap in their face. And it's fundamental. So the confiscation of the assets and their social use is also a uh, has a cultural and educational purpose, a social purpose in the area. So those areas have been cleared of violence. But having said this, in Argentina, in Albania, and in other countries, we are collaborating so that more people will be involved with the same purpose. That is to say, to confiscate these assets uh, from criminals and give them back to the collectivity, to the community, and uh, give them back dignity and uh, employment and uh, fair products. But all this can be included in a wider framework. Uh, and we have to say loud. We have to say that hunger is criminal. On our earth, almost one billion people, the official figure yesterday was 828 million people, so almost one billion people at present suffers from hunger, and for many that means death. That's not possible. That's not acceptable. And food security, as the UN says, and other organizations said, involves 2 billion, 300 million people, and that's, that's a shame and it should touch our conscience. Malnutrition, so there are three different aspects on our um, planet. Uh, they need our responsibility. They need responsibility from all of us. So the uh, fight poverty, but we also have to be aware of the fact that there is a political poverty. The, 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 Politics doesn't do what it has to do. And in the last two or three years, uh, uh, there was a, a step back what was made. Hunger increased, um, food insecurity increased, malnutrition increased on the globe. This is partly due to the COVID pandemic, but it's also due to the wars. At present, there are 59 wars underway, and very little is said about them. And these wars contribute to um, further increase all this. And therefore, the issue of food, the issue of hunger, people are still uh, dying. 
are still starving. Causes migrations, huge migrations, and the despair of thousands of people. But there's also hunger for freedom, for justice, for the dignity and democracy. And we are involved in this type of hunger. That is to say, we uh, want to uh, confiscate the assets from corrupted people and uh, free them. So if you happen to buy in some supermarket those products with the brand Libera Tella, Terra, you'll find on the, on the uh, label that these products come from the land confiscated uh, uh, from uh, organized crime. But we also therefore have to choose correctly. We have to uh, fight uh, the right to life, the right to food, is a fundamental right and is the right that uh, makes all the other rights possible because if we do not eat we die without water we're not able to live and today we have four billion people who suffer from uh, the lack of water so A global use of water increased over the years due to irrigation, but fresh water accounted just for 2% of water on the earth. And as to the availability of fresh water to human beings is just 0.2%. And that's not acceptable. So we have to do something. All of us have to do something. You are the masters, you are the experts in this. And so uh, just three multinational, three big corporations in the world control 63% of the grains market and 75% of uh, agro um, chemicals or drugs. That's not acceptable. So we have to fight against that. that. All of us have to uh, fight and we have to join forces to fight all this. Thank you. Allora, ricordate libera terra in libero stato, se può. Free land in a free state, uh, that's a slogan uh, that I'd like to remind you of. Uh, we have another 15 minutes and I suggest that we go around the table quickly to say something about uh, uh, topical issues and I'd like to hear from all of, of you uh, what concerns uh, you most out of the many challenges, uh, um, the increase in the price of raw materials, uh, inflation rates in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia and Somalia, inflation is 44%, five times higher than ours. There are problems that we never hear about. So what's the worst threat? The lack of raw energies, the price of energy, the scarcity of water, the lack of brains among our politicians, the war, the conflicts between humans. Should you start with one of these problems? What would you like to change? What would you remodel in order to start again and to be regenerated? Victoria. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, uh, the right of the small farmers who are the ones feeding uh, the world should really be protected. No? If uh, small farmers, which include indigenous peoples, are the ones who are conserving uh, the grains that are very much needed, the seeds, as well as sustaining the, the biodiversity in the world, as well as taking care of the soil and the microbes in the soil. So I think the, the small farmers should be protected. They should be given uh, the right to continue tilling in their lands. And uh, the control of these few uh, big corporations over the food system should be removed. Grazie. Allora, proteggere, proteggere i piccoli agricoltori. Antonio, da dove cominceresti? Eh, 
Não vou sair muito dessa resposta. Well, uh, as a farmer, one of the main threats concerns uh, seeds. I agree with Vittoria. We have been discussing about that and also the bees. Without bees, uh, there is no food, and that's a very important uh, issue. If we don't take good care of our bees, we won't have uh, uh, land, water, seeds, and food because we uh, will be lacking pollinators. Of course, there are other pollinators, but the bees are essential for family-run uh, uh, farms and for farm uh, uh, households. So the issue of, of water and seeds in Brazil nowadays, we have a law uh, that says that 20 percent of uh, uh, what is uh, produced um, organically should be used for seeds. And that means that in five years, 100% of the crops could be organic. And I insist on the bees. Well, I'd start with the cultural drift. If the economic capitalist system is uh, not just uh, a form of government, but it's a form of thinking, and the maximization of profits is the only goal for humans, artists, uh, politicians, uh, making one uh, euro more than the day before is uh, what uh, drives most uh, people. And as long as uh, this is the goal of everyone, we lose sight of smaller uh, realities. Uh, large corporations grab the land. So I, and I'd start from each of us, because I, I, I'd start with and from individual people. We should all uh, train, retrain ourselves and learn to think in a different way. And rather than following influencers, we should go back to a situation um, where our goal is not just uh, to become richer in money, uh, visibility, attention, etc. We should really start from scratch. We can all make one euro less. Uh, how about you, Luigi Ciotti? Well, I'd simply like to say that the worst disease here in our country is uh, um, um, is thinking that the responsibility always lies with someone else. So people who are neutral, people who look on what the others do without taking on their responsibilities are the worst threat. Also, resignation, when they tell you things will never change, that's not good. So it's a cultural and educational challenge because culture awakens consciences. And I'd like to say something Think about the role of information, of, of, of the spreading of information. Uh, we're too ignorant. Uh, things are made too simple. And so we have the challenge of providing people with tools that will allow them to become aware of the situation. In Italy, we, are, we have a high rate of illiteracy. We are in Europe. Uh, the the last uh, we are the last country in Europe in terms of educational poverty. We have uh, too many school dropouts. Dropouts. So we need a cultural battle. We need to make people awareness of this cultural problem, so that we are all educated enough to support those who fight for freedom for the freedom, for, for their dignity and right. And young people can be wonderful. We should not tease them. They are ready to fight for good ideals. But politics should, uh, uh, should provide measures that are serious and, and caring vis-a-vis -vis young people. We should make room for young people. 
so let's uh, stop uh, uh, being neutral and not taking on responsibilities. Let's uh, stop using alibis. Alibis are false solutions to problems. I think uh, you all agree with what has uh, been said so far, so maybe this debate is useless. Uh, but maybe what we said was useful because we strengthened our beliefs, our ideas. And before I close, I'd like to thank the interpreters. Thank you for listening to us. And before we close, we have a video from Marcia Chatelain, who's a, a who won a um, Pulitzer Prize. I'd like to thank Antonio Menchez dos Santos for coming from Brazil, all the way from Brazil, to speak for 15 minutes. Uh, we are really grateful. I'd like to thank Willy Piotte, who came from the center of Turin. So he lives much closer, but he was as deeply motivated to come and talk. I'd like to thank Don Luigi Ciotti, who came from another world that doesn't exist yet, uh, telling us that we should all join him in that alternative world. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Victoria Daudi uh, um, Corpus, and uh, I ha- invite uh, someone to write a Wikipedia page about our native uh, tribe and to Hi, follow us Hi, my name is online. Marcia Chatlin. I'm a scholar and a writer in Washington, D.C. I'm the author of the book Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. And I am so excited to be able to share um, greetings to the slow food movement as you gather together at the Terra Madre in Turin. I wish I could join you in Italy right now, but I am incredibly thrilled to have an opportunity to reflect on the um, Salon del Gusto topic of the planet and true social justice. And so what I can offer today is this, is that when we think about what our planet needs in terms of justice, we know that the climate crisis has forced us to think about our modes of production, our modes of consumption, our relationships globally, the ways that climate has forced entire communities and populations into essentially refugee status. We know that the resources that we have from nature are not always um, replenished. And so as we move towards questions of sustainability, I often think about my research on food and the role of food in society as a critical part of answering that question of how we bring uh, climate and planet justice to social justice. And I think that It's the type of processes that come out of movements like slow food, the ability to convene, to share, to gather, to nourish as a larger community. These are the steps it takes for the problem solving that we're going to need uh, for centuries to come. The question of justice does not just remain in the soil and the way that we treat the earth but it's the question of how does justice for the earth's inhabitants, how do they animate itself in the life of everyday people who are making conscientious choices about housing, about childcare, about food, about uh, product consumption, about how they engage their resources, whether it's their financial resources or their personal resources. And so at the heart of slow food is this idea that It is through appreciation and discernment that we are able to really create a vision that is purposeful, that does not find its um, solutions overnight, but that takes its time to really deliberate on how we deliver justice. And I think that from my research, what I found is that the more opportunities communities have to gather, the more that they are free from fear and from want, the better they are at not only creating a vision, but creating strategies for a sustainable vision towards the future. You know, much of the conversation about sustainability um, throughout the globe is about the environment. But when we think about racial and economic and gender justice as part of sustainability, we are forced to ask ourselves, does this solution anticipate? Does this solution include? Does this solution imagine um, a rapidly changing, diversifying uh, world? Does it take into account the various histories that people bring with them as they 
are confronted with the many challenges of our nation and our world. And can it imagine um, modeling um, an inclusive and dynamic approach to thinking through our future problems? And so I think what Slow Food has the opportunity to do um, in thinking about planets and justice and people is to continue to inspire people in these moments of conversation to think about the actors that are visible as well as the forces that are invisible in the decisions we make and the options that are put in front of us. I'm so thrilled that these convenings are happening and they are asking questions not just about um, food for the sake of food or food as an indicator of culture or food as a um, precondition for building community, but food as a critical source of challenge, a critical source of opportunity for greater and um, dynamic thinking. And so I hope your convening is going well. I hope that this movement continues to engage and inspire people around the world. And hopefully next time we can all be together as we break bread and we think seriously about justice for today as well as tomorrow.